This is a much longer problem that will give you some practice doing mass percent and empirical formula from data. This is a little bit more complex of a problem, and I thought it would be best done podcasted so that you can go back and rewind as much as needed. This section of the problem is just to give you some background on the material that we're going to be doing this problem on, though not of any particular importance to the problem solving. We have gallic acid, which contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is the problem's way of telling you that everything in the species must be carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen. The chemist is going to burn some of this, specifically very close to exactly one gram, and analyze what comes off. Generally, when you do a combustion analysis, you're measuring CO2 and water. From this, we want you to determine the empirical formula, and then using the given molar mass, finding the molecular formula. Now, additionally, I wanted you to have some practice on finding different types of molecular formulas based off different numbers. And so I'm going to add in an extra piece to the problem. There's a few things that you have to think about and that you have to know when starting this problem. First off, you must remember what combustion is. If you didn't learn this in chapters one and two, prep chem or high school, now's the time. Here we have our hydrocarbon, our C, H, and O. We don't know what the empirical formula is, so I've simply put X's, Y's, and Z's as placeholders. Combustion always includes the reaction with oxygen of a hydrocarbon, and the hydrocarbon may or may not have other things. In this problem, we were told it's just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen though, and it forms carbon dioxide and water. Now we need to think about some things. We're only told the amount of carbon dioxide and water. So we know this and we know this. If we think about where all of the carbon came from, there's only one location for it to have come from, the hydrocarbon. And if we think about where the hydrogen came from, there's only one place for it to have come from, the hydrocarbon. And so by using carbon dioxide, we can find the moles of carbon. And by using water, we can find the moles of hydrogen. Now, the oxygen's a bit different because our oxygen went to both of these places. However, it came from both our hydrocarbon and our free flowing oxygen gas. So we can't figure out our oxygen and our hydrocarbon by simply looking at our carbon dioxide and our water because some of it also came from our oxygen gas. In order to calculate our oxygen, what we'll instead need to do is recognize that if we know our grams of carbon and we know our grams of hydrogen, then if we add those, our grams of oxygen must add up to be one gram. So after finding the carbon and the hydrogen, we can find the oxygen by subtracting those from a gram. So let's start on this problem. We'll start with our part A, determine our empirical formula. In each case, we want to find out how many moles of carbon and how many moles of hydrogen are present. And we're gonna start from the given amount of CO2 in water. We'll use the CO2 to find the amount of carbon present, and we'll use our water to calculate our hydrogen present. To get from grams of CO2 to moles of carbon, we must first get to moles of CO2. We do this by using our molecular mass of carbon dioxide off the periodic table. This leaves us with moles of CO2. Because there is one mole of carbon and one mole of CO2, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And we can also say that there is this many moles of carbon. Now water. For water, we need to convert between grams of water into moles of water. Now there's one additional step here because we want moles of hydrogen. But right now there are two moles of hydrogen in every mole of water. So we must do one more conversion to get between our moles of water and our moles of hydrogen. And this leaves us with this many moles of hydrogen. Now we're getting closer and closer to those previous examples that we have done of this problem. We have our moles of carbon, we have our moles of hydrogen. All that's left is to find our moles of oxygen. To find our moles of oxygen, we can't simply use 
the moles of oxygen from both the carbon dioxide and from the water. We aren't able to do this because a significant portion of that oxygen actually comes from the oxygen that is reacting with the hydrocarbon. We don't know how much of it comes from which species, since there's no way of telling the difference between the two. Instead, what we must do is use the fact that we know how many grams of the compound we started with. We also know how many grams of carbon we have, or rather how many moles, but we can find grams, and the same thing of hydrogen. We know the number of moles, and so we can calculate the number of grams. Let's look at how to do this. We start with our one gram total. We subtract off our grams of carbon as found by using the moles that we found in the last slide multiplied by the molar mass. We also subtract off the grams of hydrogen by using our moles that we found in the last slide multiplied by the molar mass. From here we get our grams of oxygen. Now of course we don't want to compare grams, we want to compare moles. So we use the molar mass of oxygen to convert between the two. From here we get our moles of oxygen. Now we have moles of carbon, moles of hydrogen, and moles of oxygen. We're right back to where we started on our previous examples that we did in class. From here, we can take all of our values and use our trick of division to find a lowest common ratio. So we'll divide everything by the smallest number. As often is the case, this doesn't get us a whole number ratio, but it gets us to something relatively close, whereby guessing and checking by what we multiply by, we can get to a whole number. In this case, we won't get to a whole number until we multiply by five. Once we do that, we get relatively close to whole number ratios, close enough that we can assume rounding errors. You may need to go through and multiply by two, and then three, and then four, and then five to be able to find this out. But now, we're able to get our empirical formula, C7H6O5. We finished part A. This is the hardest part. Now, for part B, we want to look at the molar mass. And we want to say, does that match with the empirical formula or not? If the empirical mass and the molecular mass are the same, then so is the empirical formula and the molecular formula. If not, we need to multiply it by some integer to find the molecular formula. In this case, if we add up our, our formula mass for C7H6O5, we end up with 170.12. This is the same as our given molar mass, which means that since our formula mass and our molecular mass are the same, our formulas are the same as well. Now, I added one extra part to this because I wanted us to practice what happens if they aren't. So what if instead I gave you a molecular mass of 510? In that case, we'd have to compare the empirical mass or the formula mass of 170 with the molecular mass of 510. We can see that 170 goes into 510 three times. And since it goes in three times, we'll need to multiply the empirical formula by three. This gets us our final molecular formula if, in fact, the molecular mass was 510. And this is how you do one of those, these types of problems. You may need to watch this a couple of times to grasp all the elements of it.